Hey everybody, welcome back to Conscientious Omnivore. My name is Pal. Uh, today's video I want to talk to you guys about some gardening and, uh, you know, basically like agriculture um, type related ideas and concepts that uh, I sometimes refer to in passing in some of my gardening videos. And uh, also for anybody who's not a gardener uh, but is interested in just kind of um, the kinds of topics that I talk about in some of my uh, uh, vegan related debates um, you know or things like that uh, I think it might be helpful for you guys to know just kind of some of the the kind of backstory of what I'm talking about and uh, make sure that everybody's on the same page so um, hopefully this is interesting to all of you and uh, basically why I want to talk about a few different terms that uh, you might hear me use uh, one of them is monoculture the other one is polyculture and then permaculture and veganic growing and what these mean and um, you know how they're kind of like related so um, in uh, today's day and age, modern agriculture is very much based around the idea of monoculture. All that means is that you have mono as in one type of thing that you are trying to grow in a given area. So you have these huge fields of like one type of crop like corn or soy or whatever the case might be. Um, in the sense that I kind of talk about it as well, there's also a loss of um, genetic like biodiversity as well because more and more um, people are using the same exact type of uh, crop. So they are kind of losing all the different uh, little, um, you know, different uh, varieties that, uh, that have existed for a long time and are local to some areas. And especially with the genetically modified um, crops um, being kind of grown in more and more places, uh, they are literally genetically identical to each other and you don't see as many different kinds of like say corn, you used to have like a bunch of different varieties, different colors, same thing with squashes or apples or really pretty much anything. Um, you know, plants are uh, just like, you know, animals and people, they are um, changing over time and they do, uh, you know, cross pollinate and they do develop different, um, you know, kind of like, um, characteristics as the uh, as time goes on and um, you can definitely get things that are um, suited to local conditions but what happens in monoculture is uh, you kind of ignore all that and kind of work against nature and just force everything to, to grow that one um, particular type and um, you know ultimately uh, this is a pretty destructive kind of thing it's a, it's a very unnatural thing and what ends up happening is because you have all the same type of thing growing in one area, you start get, getting into problems with uh, pests and uh, things like that where, um, you know, it, it's, it's kind of like an unnatural situation. If you imagine if you're like a specific type of bug that likes a specific type of food and all of a sudden you come into one of these fields where there's just like, as far as the eye can see, the same exact thing, that type of um, you know organism will be able to just kind of like it, it blow up and, and have all the food it needs available and it can like uh, get huge you know population growth um, that's kind of unnatural for that given environment it's not a natural ecosystem the other thing that happens is that uh, you can create imbalances in the soil as well because um, one type of plant growing in the soil will take one, you know certain types of uh, nutrients Whereas other types of um, you know plants that might grow there, they might take something else, and you will get a more kind of natural um, uh, usage of the nutrients in the ground. There's also the problem of you know most uh, um, you know commercial large-scale agriculture isn't uh, returning the um, you know the product of the growth back into the soil. They're using either artificial fertilizers or you know um, manure. Uh, to refertilize it, and uh, and basically, you know, you you're losing kind of this more traditional crop rotation that people did, or the companion planting, as I've talked about before, with like the three sisters planting, where you have corn and um, you know beans and squash growing in the same area. The beans are nitrogen fixing; they take nitrogen from the air and they put it into the ground, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you get a whole bunch of problems from pests to um, fertilizers. Uh, and, and basically the, the problems kind of are really large scale and, um, and, and quite serious. Now polyculture is the opposite of monoculture. You want to have a variety of things growing. It definitely encourages uh, a more diverse uh, you know, set of um, uh, things to be grown and it also as a result uh, 
lessens your chances of uh, being wiped out by a specific type of um, you know, problem, a blight, a, a pest, uh, or even like weather condition. Like if you're only growing one type of thing that all fruits at the same time, you could get a late frost or a late, um, you know, like an ice storm or something and it'll like crush all your small fruits and then you have no harvest. Whereas if you had stuff that was like split up where it was going to produce fruit for you later, that might still save you and you get, you know, some harvest. So there's, there's a lot of benefits to having um, polyculture. The uh, reason why it's not more popular than it is, is that it's uh, a lot harder to mechanize. So it's a lot harder to mechanize the um, planting, it's a lot harder to mechanize the harvest, etc, etc. And where does permaculture fit into this? Permaculture is like an even kind of like higher level of, of kind of like thinking and working with nature as opposed to the monoculture. So in um, permaculture you, you basically want to take the principles of like working with nature as opposed to against it. You want to look at what works for a given area and, um, and then work around that or work to kind of enhance that if, if possible, but you certainly never want to fight against it. So they, um, they encourage pretty much like a really high level of diversity, a lot of different kinds of plants. They um, tend to, you know, not want to fix um, problems. They don't view things as problems. It's like if you have too many of some kind of pest, it's probably because there's some kind of unnatural imbalance that's been created in that area. And um, the way to fix it is not through the use of chemicals and you know um, pesticides and herbicides for weeds and things like that. It's to kind of like look at the balance of the nutrients available in the soil, for example. And um, there's things you can do to basically you know make uh, make that either through amendments or by growing certain types of crops. If, you, if your soil is, for example, like too nitrogen rich, you can grow certain types of things that will reduce the um, the nitrogen level and then it'll be more um, amenable to growing some other type of thing that you want to grow. So there's a whole bunch of um, things that you can learn and, um, and work with so that you're not struggling and fighting against uh, what's there and, um, and instead you can kind of like have nature be helping you. The more diverse um, environment you have, the more diverse the animals, the wildlife, everything in there, and then you're going to hopefully not be um, plagued by any kind of like one type of thing that's like taking over the whole thing. And um, there's, a, there's a bunch of websites and um, books and things like that that I would recommend if anybody's interested in these topics. I've talked about uh, some of the books that have inspired me um, previously in other videos, but uh, I can't say it enough. Like The One Straw Revolution by Asanobu Fukuoka, I think that's just like, you know, can't give that enough thumbs up. Everybody should read that if you're at all interested in gardening and, and if you love the idea of growing food. Um, that was hugely inspirational for me personally of uh, wanting to start a um, food forest of my own and grow our own food for, for my family. So I would definitely recommend that. That is just a wonderful book. And uh, I've mentioned it before as well, but Sepp Holzer's, uh, Sepp Holzer's Permaculture book, um, the title of the book is Permaculture. I would absolutely recommend that. And, um, you know, I, I just can't say enough good things about that. And, and, he, and that book gets very nitty gritty down to like specific things that you can do. And he tells you about companion planting and, um, you know, things like I, I mentioned, like what you should grow if your soil is either to this or to that, um, you know, and how you can work together to, uh, you know, to basically like, like get a very effective um, garden without the use of chemicals and, and uh, you know, pesticides and herbicides and other like external inputs. So I think those are very uh, handy. I would definitely recommend those. And I would also recommend um, some additional uh, channels here on YouTube that um, you would probably enjoy. One of them is called The Gardening Channel uh, with uh, James Prigioni. I'll have a link uh, for, for that down below. And um, the other one is um, Planting Freedom uh, with Aaron. Uh, those guys are both really great. I've given them shoutouts before. Uh, if you go over there and um, like their content, just you know, let them know I said hi and uh, sent you. And um, yeah, those guys, uh, they are phenomenal like uh, inspirations. They both have wonderful gardens, wonderful attitudes to the garden, and I can't say enough nice things about um, the way they you know look at, at like um, growing and. And uh, yeah, both of them are huge Masanobu Fukuoka fans, and that, that's like, <laughs> I don't know, for me, that's like the, the number one inspiration. So, um, James, uh, in several of his videos, talks a lot about uh, James Lawton, 
Uh, so, did I say his name right? Ooh, man. Uh, I don't know if I got his name right. <laughs> I feel hurt. No, Jeff. Jeff Lawton. Sorry, Jeff Lawton, not James. Uh, James was the one saying the thing. So, Jeff Lawton, um, he is a big uh, permaculture guy. And then uh, Bill Mollison, I guess, is kind of the guy who coined the term uh, permaculture. And uh, he's got, you know, some books that uh, I guess are kind of like the Bible of uh, permaculture. I actually haven't read those, um, so I can't really speak for them personally. But um, knowing what uh, what I think of James and he, he views that book very highly so I will definitely try to get my hands on a copy of that at some point soon and um, I feel like you know I, I'm still learning and I'm still just at the beginning of kind of my gardening journey and learning about the food forest creation and I and I get inspired by these guys so definitely if, if anybody's interested like go check it out and um, you know really I just want to touch briefly upon kind of some of the things that I view as a benefit um, in, in you know, permaculture is that uh, we can work together with nature, we can create habitat for wild animals, um, whether they're, you know, small in the form of uh, bugs and, and bees and things like that, or larger as in the sense of like, you know, we're not going to be poisoning um, animals that, uh, that are typically viewed as pests like voles, moles, rabbits, uh, mice, you know, things like that. Um, you can definitely create systems uh, where they will not be a problem to you and you will still be able to create habitat for them. So I think that's wonderful. And um, the other thing is that, uh, yeah, you, you can work um, with a system in mind where you are trying to plan so that you try to minimize any of, any of the kind of external inputs that are uh, required. So um, when I talk about my garden, I'm talking about a veganic uh, garden. I, I do not want to have um, animal inputs. Um, there's actually some kind of, you know, gray areas there where uh, I, I actually wouldn't necessarily um, have a problem with, um, you know, the use of animal manure if I knew that it was from uh, animals that were not, um, you know, being harmed or abused or exploited, and uh, certainly, you know, I think like horse manure might fall into that category. Although there's there's some ethical concerns about uh, horseback riding um, that I don't really want to talk about in this video because it's not pertinent. But I also uh, am looking into the um, use of uh, human manure, so or who manure. Um, I still need to do more research on that, but at some point I will probably want to begin doing that as well. And um, yeah, it's just a whole bunch of interesting things um, to look into and, and learn about. And uh, it's certainly possible to do veganic gardening. So I think, you know, from the if anybody watched the debate with uh, Dr. Avi, we talked a lot about um, conventional versus um, organic uh, farming. You know, the difference, the main difference is being that um, in uh, conventional farming, they're more likely to be using animal manure for fertilizer than they would be in conventional um, farming. And, uh, you know, what veganic farming tries to do is to basically create that same kind of fertility uh, through permaculture and, and um, you know, polyculture principles uh, without the use of animal inputs. So you don't need your blood meal, your fish meal, whatever. And these are all wonderful things in my mind. So uh, it's certainly possible, it's doable. There's a lot of farms doing it already and it's an increasing um, number of farms that are doing it so it's a growing trend. So yeah, I just wanna give some examples here to finish up the, the video to talk about um, you know some of the things that I, I talked about and show them to you in, uh, in practice in the garden. And uh, before I show you those, I just want to read a couple of quick lines from uh, Sepp Holzer's book that I mentioned, um, just to give an idea of kind of what I'm talking about. Like, uh, it's this idea that, you know, we as people can just kind of fix and force everything to be the way we think, and it's not necessarily always in our interest, except that we don't see that. So he's talking about um, ways to regulate um, problem plants like weeds and, and things like that, or things that we think are problem plants, and why you know sometimes this can be kind of like a, a bad road to travel. So he says, uh, controlling and regulating things on a small scale is quite simple. Almost any desired effect can be achieved with manual labor, which leads many people to take their obsession with order too, uh, too far. They often do not consider the consequences of their actions. At this point, I would like to make these consequences clear with the following example. I have a small garden, and I want to make it neat and tidy, and remove all of the weeds in my vegetable patches. I keep the lawn short and the ground under my fruit trees neat. 
What will I achieve by doing this? The answer, a tidy, in other words, artificial garden. There is nothing left to stop the vegetable patches and fruit trees drying out because of the lack of ground cover. They've talked about ground cover all the time. So if anybody has seen those, um, yeah, definitely ground covers, super important. Uh, so then he says, so I will have to water them more. The um, hummus production on bare soil is much worse and frequent watering flushes out the nutrients, which means this, that sooner or later I will have to use fertilizer. Chemical fertilizers are bad for the soil life. Fewer creatures living in the soil makes the hummus production worse and the vicious cycle continues. A tidy garden provides useful animals and insects with little refuge and no habitat, which means that there is no natural defense against pests. The list goes on and on. This just illustrates the relationship between action and reaction in nature. If I manage my land with an understanding of nature, I can achieve great results with much less work. My methods for gardens are outlined in the garden section. Then he goes on and on. So anyway, I hope that's uh, helpful uh, to you guys. I'm going to show you guys some examples in, um, in my garden where I'm trying to apply these principles and explain to you why I think they're important. And um, yeah, I guess just um, if you enjoyed this, give it a big thumbs up. Hope to see you guys in another video soon. And um, yeah, I leave you now with the um, couple examples here from the garden. Bye. So here's like a bunch of, I don't even know what these are. Some kind of, you know, aphid or something that's on here. But uh, there's like a gazillion of them. This is part of a, uh, elderberry bush that uh, I've actually been meaning to kind of fully cut out. I've cut this back like I don't even know how many times, probably five or six times already and it's still coming back up. But uh, you know this is a good example of what I was just talking about that uh, I don't know what these things are but I could take the view of like oh there's some kind of pest they're gonna harm my fruit trees or do something else that I don't want but as long as they're on this, which I don't even care about, and isn't even producing fruit for me, um, maybe they'll stay away from my plum trees. So I'm not gonna worry about it. You know, this is a kind of a classic example of like, maybe there's some kind of imbalance that's already here, or that I've made unwittingly, and uh, unbalancing this even further by, you know, quote unquote, controlling this situation, I may actually make it worse, um, and I don't know. So I think the thing to do is to observe and really, you know, learn more about this situation before I do anything. And don't just jump to rash conclusions. I don't know what those are, I'm going to try and find out. But uh, in either case, I'm going to leave them where they are for now. We're here at the apricot tree. And, um, you know, this is the, uh, an example of the thing I'm talking about where you want to plant some, um, you know, herbs and other kinds of uh, flowers and things and chives and what have you. Uh, that will help. So what we've got here is some basil and a little bit of dill that grew in there uh, by mistake. It was just in this little pot and um, you know, I just wanted to get this uh, planted here and uh, show it to you guys. So hopefully that kind of takes off and we've got um, you know, some asparagus that I want to plant nearby as well and uh, there will be more things coming in kind of around the tree and I'll probably be expanding this mulched area as well around it. just want to quickly show some spider webs that I got here on the tomatoes and um, you know this is exactly kind of what most people would think like oh there's some kind of bugs in my garden it's like spiders are great I'm happy to see these spider webs it means there's a good healthy you know system for them here and they're probably keeping some of the pests uh, you know from destroying our tomatoes so um, this is great I don't mind this at all uh, just want to point that out real quick so a while back I did a video about uh, a little side garden that we started at my in-laws uh, backyard and I just wanted to show it to you guys and um, correct some things that I uh, had said that I actually was misinformed about. Um, I think I showed you guys that some of the tomato plants that were growing in here really nicely I had thought that my wife and my mother-in-law planted those but as it turns out they are volunteer plants that grew out of the compost uh, that we put on uh, the soil here and um, it was actually just a fortuitous chance that these uh, tomatoes grew. So all these tomatoes here in the back, the ones up front here, the ones out here, these are all just grown out from the compost. Look at these beautiful tomatoes here. And these all grew out of just um, throwing the compost on here and uh, these just, you know, came up like by themselves. 
I mean, look at these tomatoes. They're amazing. I've got to come in here and pick some, actually. Um, there's a bunch back here, too, and over here on the side. Um, just lots of them. Um, these are all, uh, you know, ones that grew up um, just unintentionally. The ones in the back here, my mother-in-law actually planted. So that back row, she actually planted. Um, and then I think some of these were from her last year garden that just came out and sprouted on their own. Um, but uh, pretty amazing that, um, you know, the stuff just grows out like this uh, all on its own. And um, just a quick update here, you know, some of the things aren't doing so well. So like our artichokes kind of grew to a point and then they just, you know, have kind of stopped and looks like maybe something's attacking them. So I'm not sure that they're doing too well. But, you know, this is kind of the beauty of, of permaculture. You kind of roll with the punches and take what you can get. Um, you can see that some stuff is doing quite well. There's even some tomatoes in the way in the back over there. They've fallen over. They should have been staked out. But, uh, yeah, I mean, we're still getting some sorrel. There's, there was a bunch of lettuce that we got. Um, there is, uh, you know, a bunch of basil that we got out of here. There was some dill. Like, lots of, you know, great stuff growing here. And, um, and look at this sage, too. It's really beautiful. This, this has done really well. So I'm actually happy about this. Um, and then, you know, what makes it even more interesting is that uh, I'm going to show you guys another section of my uh, in-law's um, uh, backyard. My, my mother-in-law is a very avid um, gardener for, for flowers. And I'm going to show you guys her side flower garden um, where she also put a lot of compost. And look at the um, volunteer plants that uh, we got there. I'll show it to you next. So she's got quite a large um, flower garden. There's a, like a flowering tree here. She's got these big yellow flowers. I don't even know what all these flowers are. There's just tons and tons of them. And um, she does a lot of work in here. She does a beautiful job keeping up all her flowers and reseeding things. And she's got stuff that's annuals and there's stuff that she's got perennials. She's got everything in here. There's an amazing mix of flowers and they're quite beautiful which is obviously great for the uh, bees too. Um, you can see a bunch of bees back there right now, hanging out. And um, yeah, they're very pretty as well. Um, this uh, cherry tree is a uh, volunteer plant as well, which is funny. But then if you start looking around, look at that, tomatoes in the back. Um, there are tomatoes in the front. There are some ripening right here. Um, look at these tomatoes, they're just wonderful. These all grew up volunteer plants from the compost that just got thrown on here because the soil was getting kind of worn down, and so she amended the compost in here. My, you know, my dream is to convince her to not um, weed so much, but uh, she actually usually weeds this down and kind of like strips it back after all the flowers are done growing. But uh, you know, that that's kind of a future state. Maybe I can convince her of that. Um, look down here. There is a uh, little melon <laughs> growing out here. So this is just awesome. I mean, like you can't, hey Fushi, you can't beat this. I mean, there's just free food growing up, like all between, you know, these plants in here. There's a bunch of beautiful flowers. I think this is part of the melon as well here. Um, I'm pretty sure it is. There's a lot of flowers at the end here. I wonder if there'll be more. I don't know, there might also be more in there. I don't really know. Um, but yeah, just tons of cool flowers and tons of cool stuff uh, growing. And then the same thing here on the other side of the steps. She's got just tons and tons of flowers here. And then if you look, there are uh, some kind of like, you know, vining um, plants down there as well. And there are some squash that are growing up over there. There's actually a little squash. I just missed it before. There's a little squash growing right here <laughs> under the step. Uh, so this is uh, some kind of butternut squash, it looks like. Um, and then there's more here out on the side. Check this out. It's kind of growing off behind all the flowers. And uh, there's just like a ton of little, um, you know, squashes that are growing off of these uh, vines. They're flowering. You can see this one's maybe dried up a little bit. So that, that should probably get pinched off. Yeah, that's not going to grow anymore. Um, but you got another little one right here. It's looking great. So... Yeah, just free food growing for us, like just left and right, man. You know, you gotta gotta love this. Like, it's just a, a beautiful, um, you know, set of flowers, and then mixed in is just a bunch of random 
uh, stuff that grew out of the compost. It's wonderful. So just wanted to show that to you guys. Thank you.